Well, thank you, Rihanna, for that introduction. It's really my pleasure to be here. I, I, I was talking uh, to the organizers earlier, and I have so much gratitude for this seminar series. If I can say there's been a ray of sunshine during this pandemic, it's being able to have this series to really connect to the field, uh, to hear the history and uh, the diversity of perspective of all of the speakers and their contributions to the field. It's really an honor for me to be here today to talk about our work um, to study these dynamic cellular processes of targeted protein degradation. So uh, I'm going to focus my talk today primarily on protax, but I have a schematic here uh, highlighting protax and molecular glues. I think of these uh, compounds working through very similar mechanisms. They converge at this formation of the ternary complex. But both of these compounds, protax and molecular glues, do something remarkable. They serve to facilitate an interaction between a target protein and an E3 uh, component, two proteins which normally would never interact within the cell. This induced proximity uh, brought together by these compounds uh, results in the ubiquitination of the target protein and subsequent degradation of, of that protein via the ubiquitin proteasome pathway. Now, early on in the days uh, when we were uh, developing protax and studying uh, degradation, especially as compared to inhibition of disease-relevant targets, it was found that for many targets, degradation had this benefit um, and a, a, a great phenotypic outcome benefit. And there are many reasons why this has been shown to be. I'll talk more about it later, but uh, degradation is an event-driven process versus the occupancy-driven process that you have with an inhibitor. Uh, we see this extended durability, treatment at lower doses, and oftentimes uh, these protax or degradation compounds, if they do not interact irreversibly, are catalytic. Uh, the power of degradation can also come in the disruption of proteins in larger complexes or involved in scaffolding. And removal of these proteins work to destabilize uh, complexes which you wish uh, to no longer function. And at a recent virtual uh, targeted protein degradation conference, uh, something that really resonated with me actually came from a, a quote or a discussion I was having with Stuart Fisher. Uh, the CSO at C4 Therapeutics, but he said, look, when we go to treat cancer, we want the hammer. And if you think about what degraders can do to proteins, they can take a population of these disease-causing proteins and clear it down to almost non-detectable levels within a matter of hours. And it can stay like that for days without retreatment or redosing of, of the compound. So in those scenarios, degraders really are the hammer uh, in terms of treatment for the disease. Where we are particularly excited and have been so inspired by this field is the translational aspect of these compounds. Um, you know, we heard a beautiful history of the molecular glues from Jay Bradner as well as Phil Chamberlain. But cell gene really pioneered uh, the, the, the repurposing of thalidomide and other MI drugs uh, to show that they were proven powerful anti-cancer therapeutics. And then you had emergence in 2018 and 2019 with our Venice's compounds heading towards the clinic and successfully continued to progress through the protax, uh, these heterobifunctional molecules also look like they are on the track to be great uh, therapeutic agents uh, for both cancer as well as now we see from Chimera's work, inflammation. So you have these, um, this potential for opening up new treatment of disease, but what this class of compounds, uh, and, and I'll show on the next slide, really does is it expands our druggable Proteome. It expands the targets so that we can think about uh, uh, for treatment of disease. And in the last few years, the field has just exploded, and we've really come 
to expand the ways that we can degrade and also redefine what is a degrader. The examples I showed you before, molecular glues and um, protax are small molecules, but uh, to even kick off this series, we heard from Carolyn Bertozzi about the development of LITAX. So now we can drive extracellular proteins, membrane proteins, to degradation through the lysosomal pathway, and not with a small molecule, but with a conjugated antibody. Uh, we've also seen uh, degradation can be driven through autophagy. Uh, Craig Cruz has, has published on uh, targeting transcription factors, specifically with Traftax. Merck has a phenomenal paper out using biodegraders, so mRNA, um, to encode a fusion of an E3 ligase to specifically remove uh, proteins, again, via degradation. Matt Disney is going to speak in this series soon about his work targeting RNA. And we also see now new levels of control of degradation uh, with the photoreversible um, protax or, or photax. So with this exciting new development in all of this area, what we, in, especially those who have studied small molecules for a long time, and switching the thinking to protax, we've really had to shift our perspective in how we think not only approaching uh, degradation, but what, what are uh, the types of parameters we wish to optimize when we develop protax? And just a few examples of this, um, uh, you know, great, and, and these are not the rules, they're not the rules for every target or projects, but we have seen, you know, I'm thinking here this marker two and four projects developed by uh, Beringer as well as Alessio Chuli's lab. But there they specifically weakened the target binding on the marker side in order to build a really potent degrader. We've seen work from GSK as well as Jin Wang's group about this transition from an irreversible binding on a kinase uh, to reversible or um, covalent reversible in order to get good degradation. Uh, beautiful work also done by Nathaniel Gray's group and Craig Cruz's group to show that you could start with an inhibitor that, which had pan activity and you actually end up getting degradation specificity in the end. And then lastly, also uh, work done here at Dana-Farber, uh, just as an example with uh, DBET1 and DBET6. But this increase in size, increase in linker, um, you know, moving in that molecular weight direction, which for inhibitors was not uh, thought to be favorable, is actually very favorable for degradation. And I will show you later on in the talk how we made an even bigger jump in molecular weight from bivalent to trivalent to improve degradation. So with this though, why, why, why are all of these directions uh, different, say, than inhibitor design? And this goes back to that thinking that this is event driven. There are many parameters in play for uh, degradation success. And at each one of the steps where the compound has to work, whether it be permeability, formation of the ternary complex, ubiquitination or degradation, there are competing processes in place that could potentially stop the degradation process. And you also don't want to get stuck at any one of these steps on the way to degradation. Uh, because this will, will hinder that process. We heard beautifully in Brenda Schulman's talk, her insight on the structural complexes uh, just within E2, E3 ligase complexes. Uh, we see this also in that recruitment of these now neo substrates into this uh, E2 positioning, uh, important for this. And this event driven, while it appears very complex and it is very complex and challenging to start with, it also gives you options that you can utilize this system and take advantage. You could have potentially a liability at one of these steps or a challenge at one of these steps and overcome it with efficiency at downstream steps uh, to achieve degradation. And that's why I believe in these uh, examples I showed earlier that we are able to achieve degradation. So with this, when we entered this field, we thought about this entire pathway. How could we deconvolute 
the mechanisms that are contributing to degradation. And our goal here really was to develop technologies or approaches to be able to monitor each one of these steps so that we could independently characterize them with the degrader. We had another goal to uh, maintain as physiologically relevant cellular context as possible for degradation. This meant working with the endogenous protein and the regulation, as well as using these full-length proteins to study inside the cell. Um, but our big goal really was, could we understand the dynamics and the kinetics of the process beyond uh, this initial snapshot photo that we have? So, these are big goals. These are big technology goals, not only for protein degradation, but the study of proteins in general. And I've been at ProMega now for 16 years, as Brianna indicated, and I really could not give this talk today without the fundamental technology development and innovation that has gone on internally at ProMega. It's truly remarkable, um, and, and it's truly, uh, you know, has also had its challenges, which is why I have this quote that I, I keep in mind, not only for technology development, but also experiments. But uh, back in 2008 and 2012, uh, we developed these core fundamental technologies that are, are critical for this work. And that is of the halotag protein, which can be fluorescently labeled with ligands, and the nanoluc luciferase, which we can utilize as a reporter. Uh, in 2015, we published uh, our, our work combining these two technologies to study protein protein interactions. This uh, is nanobrent or bioluminescence resonance energy transfer. This is critical now for us to understand the induced interactions that we see with targeted protein degradation complexes. And related to this is the study of protein small molecule interactions, uh, again with nanobread. This now utilizes as the fluorescent acceptor, a fluorescently labeled small molecule uh, to study those cellular interactions. Uh, we later then came with the split of the luciferase in what we call nanobit or the binary complementation. This now was the development of uh, peptide fragments that can complement with a larger fragment of the luciferase large bit. Uh, what I will talk about today is the use of high bits, which came from this technology development and can be used to monitor protein level. Um, but all of this, we were applying all of these approaches to study inhibitors, looking at how they impact interactions and such. But what we really needed for uh, our work in targeted protein degradation was to take these technologies to the endogenous level. And that was uh, becoming experienced and understanding uh, how to uh, insert uh, these tags, both high bit as well as halo tag, into the endogenous loci using the CRISPR-Cas9 approach. And now we had a system in place that we could monitor protein levels with high bit. And we could also, even uh, though I will not be talking about it today, study the degradation phenotype with the halo tag uh, CRISPR insertions combined with the halo protag. So, in this, all of this uh, development, what we wanted to do in targeted protein degradation was transition from this snapshot understanding that we had from Western blots into the cellular degradation process. And Western blots, we started, we still do them. Uh, this is where we started in the area of, of degraders. This is great because it captures that endogenous protein. You can look at this in the relevant cell type, but your understanding of degradation is really limited to whatever concentration and time point you choose to look at. And uh, as we were working with proteins, which were localized in several different compartments inside the cell, um, we knew they were degrading, but uh, we weren't certain if the degradation or where within the cell the degradation was occurring. So we applied the hybrid technology, which I mentioned on the previous slide. We started uh, uh, doing the CRISPR-Cas9 insertion at either N or C terminal loci of targets, uh, depending on what we know for the importance of, of their interactions. And we could also then express inside the cell the complementing factor large bits in order to now have a luminescence uh, 
beacon basically on these target protein levels that we could follow in time uh, to understand the dynamic changes of protein. At the same time, um, we had in development uh, a monoclonal antibody for HIBIS. I'm excited to present here for the first time that we were able uh, to then utilize this in immunofluorescence uh, confocal imaging in order to look at localization, not only of our endogenously tagged HIBIT proteins, but then understand and study these for degradation after treatment. And just shown here is an example of our hybrid uh, BRD4 treated with the BET uh, degrader MZ1. And you can see its nuclear localization and uh, we have clearance of this population after the MZ1 treatment. So with this in hand, um, this technology, what we're always concerned about anytime we work with any protein fusion tags is uh, whether or not the behavior of the endogenously tagged protein is matching that of the untagged. So here I have a Western blots of, of the untagged proteins, BRD4 and 2, treated with DBET1, and then also the hybrid BRD2 or 4 treated with DBET1, looking for now the calculation of the DC50. And we can see that these DC50s uh, line up, they're very close to each other, and they also show the preference of this compound for BRD2 degradation relative to BRD4 in both, um, in, in both comparing the, the untagged versus the endogenously hybrid tags. We then did a time course, and we specifically did this with BRD2 as well as 4 because they have different uh, recovery profiles after exposure to these degraders. And what you can see is, again, across the time course, we see very similar um, profiles, both in terms of initial loss, that initial rate of loss, as well as uh, the recovery profiles. And lastly, with any tag, um, especially if you have a tag that contains lysines and you're looking to study a degradation process, uh, you want to be certain that the lysines are not promoting degradation or changing in any way that rate of degradation. So we actually took the hybrid and we removed the lysines, replaced them with arginines. Unfortunately, this doesn't have as bright of luminescence, but it had sufficient for us to measure. We did this as a CRISPR insertion, and then we directly compared the hybrid tag, uh, which contains the lysines, to the hybrid uh, endogenous tag without, and we saw there was no change in uh, the degradation amount or rate um, with these. So with this in hand and, and uh, this validation work on the technology, we really wanted to focus in on those kinetic profiles to really understand the dynamics. And uh, when possible, we like to calculate as much as we can throughout the degradation process to really now allow us a tool to rank order and understand compounds, not only on a protein against a series of compounds, but the same compound against our related family members. So we could parse apart this profile, and just shown here is a very nice graph uh, where we have a single exponential decay that we can calculate a rate from. We can clearly find uh, that Dmax that occurs, and uh, we haven't been able to model yet, but uh, because it's not single phasic, but there is always a recovery profile we find for the various concentrations. Um, we then just shown here is an example that we've published uh, of MZ1, uh, a BET family degrader, which binds to both or all three, BRD2, 3, and 4. And you can see with these various profiles at the same concentration, the vastly different response uh, each one of these proteins have. And that's due to those different protein homeostasis as well as regulation and response just in general to the degradation process. And we can then compare these rates of degradation from these profiles across the concentration series, and as mentioned, rank order the efficacy and potency of these compounds uh, amongst the family members. So this really was that technology piece that we've developed, but we got started in this field very early on, and um, we were thinking too 
there's another academic component or, or uh, that, that we can contribute. And it was really in looking at what are the new frontiers in targeted protein degradation. And I think a theme of all of these presentations in this series has really been towards what are the discovery of the new modalities of degradation. Uh, we have the excellent work. Uh, by Ben Ebert's lab of new molecular glues being discovered, new mechanisms, and we'll hear also about that probably from Georg Winter uh, when he presents. We have use of degrons uh, that we heard just recently uh, from Bill Kalin's work, or um, the use of degrons really to, to um, induce degradation of new systems. And uh, all of this, as well as the light tax and these new modes of what degraders uh, could be. But what we thought really, uh, how could we contribute to this discovery of new modalities? And in 2017, when I was presenting on degradation at a conference, I was asked at that conference, you know, but resources aside, risk aside, uh, chemistry aside, if you could do anything in targeted protein degradation, what would you do? Um, and I really got to thinking about this and uh, had a lot of ideas floating around. And, um, you know, Brianna mentioned we love to collaborate with people. And the person that actually asked me this question was Alessio Chuli. And we started brainstorming ideas. And the, the thing that we thought could be very interesting for the field is to see if we could actually make a trivalent protac. And the hypothesis we had really was, could we increase valency as a strategy to boost this mode of action? And, um, you know, back in 2017, when we were discussing this, you know, it was kind of radical because people were already thinking that this movement from monovalent degraders to bivalent degraders, having compounds in the thousand molecular weight range was was so big, these compounds were not going to be really cell permeable, they couldn't potentially be drugs, right? So now thinking of taking that bivalent to now trivalent um, was, was seeming like we were moving in the wrong direction. But we really had this belief that this could potentially work and not only potentially work, but could potentially result in a better uh, degrader. And both Alessio and I have a lot of experience uh, working in BET with BET family members, especially in inhibition and Alessio clearly uh, with MZ1 in degradation. And so this is, was our starting point for this uh, trivalent protect project. So we had worked and published in 2016 with AstraZeneca to characterize their cellular bi-BET inhibitor. At the same time, a paper came out from Jay Bradner's lab where they built MZ1, which was uh, also a bivet inhibitor, but the two things that these bivalent bet inhibitors had in common was that they were both more potent than the monovalent inhibitors, JQ1 and IBET151. And we also saw, there were beautiful structures available, that both of these compounds could engage simultaneously the bromo domains within the bet family members. So the structural information was available. And when uh, Alessio modeled and looked at these structures, uh, we saw the bivet didn't really have any area on it for potential further optimization, but structurally, the MT1 had this linker solvent exposed region from which we could think to then branch off an E3 ligase uh, recruiter and derivatization point. And then uh, Alessio took his own structure, the MZ1. Uh, bound to the BD2 of BRD4 with VHL and also found a point of attachment there. And I'm not showing all of the structures, but here's just an example of one such trivalent structure uh, chemical that was made with a VHL handle. Uh, we also additionally made uh, Cerebron handles as well. So with this, and, and I'm just skipping over all of that chemistry and all of the, the innovation that needed to happen in order to get the trivalent structure. But um, yeah, it was really fantastic that Alessio and his team were able to build these trivalent compounds. Uh, we then profiled for degradation, just shown here as a Western blot in HEC 293 of uh, the endogenous BRD2, 3, and 4. And what you can see from this Western blot is that uh, these VHL-based compounns, uh, the SIM1 through 3, 
really showed robust degradation and, and more potent degradation with, than the MC1. Whereas that we were seeing degradation with the Cerebon based, but not as striking as with the VHL based. Uh, we then did a lot of studies and just shown here is a cell viability study in a bet relevant cell line MV411. And we found that these uh, trivalent degraders of the bet family members uh, were more potent in bet sensitive or bet relevant assays compared to any of the inhibitors we had available as well as the bivalent uh, bet degraders or the standard bet family protax. We then moved to looking at the kinetic degradation profiles in the HIBIT um, CRISPR cell lines, just shown here is the HIBIT BRD4. You can see this really rapid loss uh, with the trivalent compound, especially the VHL base. Uh, much slower degradation observed with the Cerebron and um, more partial degradation. And then when we ran the, the titration series of the most potent compounds in one, which I'll focus on uh, for the rest of the talk, we saw near complete degradation across a four log concentration range. So I didn't talk about it, but you know, a, a game in the protax is really uh, managing that ternary complex formation versus the com competitive binary com uh, complexes. And typically, if you get too high of concentration, you start uh, favoring those binary complexes and you get what we call is the hook effect. So the slowing down of the rate and actually the slowing down of the Dmax at the higher concentrations. And we simply just did not see this at these higher concentrations with the trivalent compound. We then lowered the dose response because what we need to really understand to calculate the potency of these compounds is where they stop the degrading. So we started now in an upper limit of 10 nanomolar and went down for all family members. Here are the profiles of each family member in the high bit uh, CRISPR lines. We were able to look at that rate and just shown here is how fast uh, these, this degradation processes occurred at the very low concentration. So just shown here on the rate is up to 10 nanomolar and you see BRD2 degrades the fastest of all of the family members. And we are also able to calculate these Dmax50 values and we see picomolar uh, degradation values emerging for all of the family members for this trivalent compound. Uh, we previously published that that initial degradation rate is highly correlated with the efficiency of ubiquitination. Uh, we did this again uh, for the trivalent compound and just shown here is looking at, at cellular loop ubiquitination in a kinetic format at this 10 nanomolar concentration. And you see it very nicely mirrors those initial degradation rates we see where BRD2 has the strongest response. And I'll get back to mechanistically why we think BRD2 is doing this, but just uh, remember this for later. We then have studied extensively all of the BET family protax. Uh, uh, so we look to see how this trivalent BET family protax compares uh, both in terms of degradation rates as well as potency. And again, now just looking at these lower concentrations, you see this rate of degradation initiated by the trivalent is faster than the other existing uh, bivalent BET family protax. And when we compare now these Dmax50 values uh, across the family series, again, in general, uh, we see that the trivalent for all the family members is, is more potent uh, than the, the bivalent protax, either with VHL or Cerebron based handles. So in characterizing this transition from bivalent to trivalent, yes, the potency of degradation has improved. The rate of degradation has improved. What does this ternary complex look like? So uh, this was one of the big questions even when we started. If we made a compound with three warheads, would all of the warheads be engaged at once? Would it form a favorable ternary complex? And what are some of the other mechanistic differences that could be leading to this improved degradation rate and Dmax? So this is work done in the Lacios group on the biochemical uh, characterization of the complex. Here he has a tandem domain 
of just the BD1 with the BD2 from BRD4 and uh, incubation with either MZ1, uh, which would occupy one of the sides of the Bromo domains within that tandem domain, uh, MT1, which is the parental or uh, bivalent BET inhibitor, should occupy both, and then the SIM1 trivalent compound. And he sees this shift of engagement of both BD uh, domains uh, with SIM1 very similar to the MT1 and uh, not the single occupancy in a BRD4 uh, that MZ1 has. Uh, he then further added the um, VCB complex to more mimic what the actual formation of the ternary complex is. And now we see uh, this one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one stoichiometry between the VHL complex, the SIM1, and the BRD4. So uh, the SIM1 is able to engage both BD1 and BD2 simultaneously and form uh, uh, with both with all the warheads in the trivalent uh, compound engaging at the same time. And I'm not going to show it, but we also have cellular data to support this as well. So then we looked at the ternary complex to understand are there any differences uh, between BD1 and BD2 engagement within the full length protein? So here's the ternary complex uh, formation. We can see it's initiated by SIM1. We also have this control, which is an antimer form of SIM1 called CIS-SIM1, and now has the VHL basically disabled where the ternary complex cannot form, but both of those JQ1 uh, warheads can interact with the BRD4. And uh, when we make a point mutant into the full-length BRD4 protein at the first BD1 domain, we see a reduction in the ability to form ternary complex. Interestingly, when we make a point mutant again in the context of the full-length protein into the BD2, we see almost abolishment of the ternary complex formation. And this really supports that uh, even within the trivalent, there would be differential domain binding first into BD2 and then into BD1 to form this ternary complex. Um, also, uh, I'm not going to go in uh, today, but uh, Alessio has generated fantastic SPR data to support this in the biochemical setting. But all of these, again, support this cis engagement into BD1 and BD2 with this trivalent compound. So, Going back to the very start, right, we, we took a bivalent, a heterobifunctional compound, and now made it trivalent. Um, the molecular weight is around 15 or 1600 of these compounds. And is this thing permeable? Well, clearly it's permeable, it's degrading, but how permeable is it? So here we've moved to our target engagement technology. And uh, this really allows us to interrogate uh, both the binding affinity as well as the permeability. Uh, we can perform this assay in lytic to understand that affinity and then compare it uh, to the live cell to understand what is the uh, impact of the binding uh, that's due to the permeability. So here we looked on VHL, since all of these are VHL binders, we have a fluorescent compound that binds to VHL, and then we treat the cells with either the MZ1 protac or the trivalent SIM1 protac, and we look for the competitive displacement or loss of this signal. And when we look in permeabilized format, so we take out any contribution to the permeability, we see that all of these compounds roughly have the same affinity for uh, VHL binding as uh, the parental E3 uh, ligand, the VH298. Uh, when we look in live cell, we do start to see a shift in permeability, but there is a shift that's very similar for both MZ1, the bivalent, as well as the trivalent SIM1. So yes, it's not, um, uh, we, we expected a shift in permeability moving from the small molecule VH298 to the protac, uh, but we're not seeing a significant difference between a bivalent protac permeability and a trivalent protac permeability. So MZ1 here has a slightly better permeability, but it doesn't have as robust degradation. So there has to be more contributing factors in the mechanism um, that is driving this robust uh, the degradation with SIM1. So we looked at the ability uh, kinetics again, 
to form the ternary complex inside the cell. And we took our kinetic profiles of ternary complex formation for each of the family members. We looked across several concentrations and we found in general that treatment of the cells with the trivalent compound resulted in a faster formation inside the cell of ternary complex relative to the bivalent. But we further asked, is there another way to study cellular ternary complex? And for this, uh, we moved to thinking about residence time. And there hasn't been a lot of talk in the PROTAC community about residence time and the impact of residence time. As I mentioned in the very beginning, you don't want to get trapped at any particular stage, especially a stage that would be unfavorable in leading to degradation. And uh, the con concern might be that if you optimize residence time, you might get trapped either in the binary binding uh, between the target and the protac or even the ternary complex. But we wanted to look here and see if we could learn about uh, ternary complex formation and potential cooperativity by using residence time measurement. So here uh, is just an example uh, diagram of this experiment. We saturate the target, in this case, as shown here as BRD4, with the PROTAC or the inhibitor. Uh, we then let that equilibrate. Then we come in with the fluorescent tracer. Now, if the inhibitor or the PROTAC has a fast residence time, you will see that signal increasing very quickly upon addition of the tracer. The signal comes up fast for a short residence time. If that uh, compound has a longer residence time, it will take more time for that signal to come up. And uh, when we did this first, um, just looking at the inhibitors, so MT1, we expected a long residence time for MT1 because it can engage into both of these domains relative to the JQ1 uh, monovalent. And indeed, we saw that lag, so that longer residence time with MT1. Now, MZ1, which we know uh, from both structural and SPR work from Alessio's lab forms this cooperative complex. Uh, we saw actually that uh, this protag has an extended residence time on BRD4. So that was one of our first uh, exciting indications that we could understand cooperativity and cellular cooperativity of the ternary complex. Now, much to our surprise, when we looked at SIM1, we saw, wow, its residence time was very long on the target. Uh, that's shown here in gold. And you can see this delayed response of SIM1 and exchanging with that fluorescent tracer. Now, what was very interesting to me, we could take that enantiomer compound, the system one, which cannot bind to the VHL. Therefore, it cannot bind uh, or form the ternary complex. And that residence time reverted to that of the, the parental inhibitor, MT1. So it, from these data, we can see that that ability to further engage the VHL and form the ternary complex has now this stabilized uh, uh, formation inside the cell. And I would want to come back to VRD2 because we saw it had this incredibly fast rate of ubiquitination. It also had uh, the lowest Dmax50 value. So when we compared BRD2 residence time to BRD4 residence time, we found that BRD2 had even more prolonged residence time uh, in the SIM1 relative to that, the BRD4. And we think this component really is enhancing or stabilizing that ternary complex at, and is really what is driving the sufficient degradation at the very low concentrations. And this came to us to, to delineate this model where we have this new form of ternary complex with the trivalent that has not only the cooperativity that we've seen uh, with previous, previous bivalent uh, protax, but has this added layer of avidity uh, within the ternary complex due to that increase of valency of binding on the target side. And the result is that we can efficiently form ternary complex at extremely low concentration, but we also efficiently form ternary complex that leads to degradation at the high concentrations. And this perhaps is why we're not seeing that hook effect over such a wide range of, of uh, degrader concentrations. And it's delaying relative to others. So this is how we kind of thought about the ternary complex in this trivalent avid cooperative as compared to bivalent cooperative complexes. 
bivalent non-cooperative complexes, as well as molecular glues, which uh, they themselves do not experience this hook effect. Um, but maybe more exciting and, and kind of like forward thinking in the larger picture, uh, this, while we worked here on the fat proteins and we, we successfully degraded these fat proteins at such low concentrations, we think the trivalent is really a, a structure, a new modality for which you could think about bringing more than one protein uh, to, to anything, really. It doesn't have to be degradation. That, that third component doesn't have to be the A3 ligase. But as we look at all the new induced molecular uh, proximity compounds, you could really think about doing a lot of things uh, with the trivalent uh, compound. And just uh, listed here is our preprint on, on Chem Archive for any further information. So with this um, goal of new modalities, we also had another goal, and I'll uh, uh, approach this in my next project, of understanding degradation specificity both looking at target uh, degradation versus off-target degradation. And also really understanding what does it mean when you see protein loss? Is that on mechanism? Is that happening via the degrader? Or is uh, your addition of the compound uh, driving protein loss through other cellular mechanisms? And uh, going back to this hammer idea, it's fantastic to have the hammer say for uh, cancer and these targets, but could we use uh, degradation in a slightly more subtle fashion, either fine tuning the level of degradation, fine tuning out uh, degradation of certain isoforms or engineering in specificity. And we were really inspired by the work from Nathaniel Gray's group with the pan-active kinase uh, degrader to show that you could start with this pan-active Precursor molecule, make it a degrader, and now see the specificity. And we noticed uh, in this analysis where they looked in an unbiased uh, mass spectrometry fashion for degradation targets, that several family members from the CDK family were found to be either partially lost or completely lost after treatment with this compound in various cell lines. We had an additional interest in CDK, so we asked this question, what does degradation look across uh, the larger family members with this compound? So there are 21 CDK family members. We went ahead and did hybrid CRISPR insertions either to the N or the C termini of 16 of these family members. Uh, just listed here is the zygosity uh, of this insertion is determined by sequencing. And um, also we wanted to cover all the relevant subfamilies in terms of functionality from the cell cycle CDKs to the transcriptional CDKs as well as the understudied to see if we could see any emerging trends of degradation amongst these family members. And you can see here we're able with the luminescence, now the hybrid tag, to really understand and look at the endogenous uh, protein level of each one of these CDKs. And you can see there's we have representation over several log order range of these CDKs. Uh, with this panel study. And the most abundant CDKs we find are the cell cycle and the transcriptional CDKs. So with this, we applied the, the pan kinase protag, the TL12186, to all of the family members. And uh, I don't, I'm not going to go through each one of these profiles one by one, but this really is a snapshot to show you how different every single family member responded to the same protag compounds and um, really maybe give you an appreciation for what you learn when you start to look at these kinetic profiles uh, relative to just the snapshots at certain time points as well as a certain concentration. And that just highlighted here, CDK 10, 12, and 13, show what, what we would consider classical profiles we see this burst loss, degradation, a sustained loss of degradation. And that hook effect that I talked about earlier, uh, we see this at this higher concentration. So those darker lines, you see them slowing down for degradation um, and taking longer to achieve that Dmax. We also saw very unusual profiles and just highlighted here for that to CDK2, CDK8, which did not show any degradation until the one micromolar. 
And CDK11, which had this delayed degradation that didn't start until hour 10. So we, we see profiles like that and we start to really wonder, uh, is this protact mediated or has some upstream event happened that now there is a, a transcriptional or translational uh, process in place that is causing loss of this protein? So we really wanted um, to cluster and analyze these again based upon functionality of the CDKs. We put the cell cycle uh, CDK responses together with the and then the transcriptional and the understudy. Uh, what was immediate to us was that all of the cell cycle CDKs showed this partial loss of degradation, very slow. Um, linear loss, uh, not what we would consider the classical profiles. So we really wanted to understand mechanistically why are the, C why are the cell cycle CDKs uh, behaving in this way? Is it on target uh, uh, protact mediated loss that we're seeing? And so we did follow up studies with CDK2. And we did choose CDK2 because it's a very interesting and important uh, CDK kinase, but we also know its cycles structurally uh, not only through several complexes throughout the cell cycle, but also several states uh, in regulation through phosphorylation of structurally active versus inactive states. And what we wanted to know is there differential degradation of CDK2 dependent upon cell cycle? And if so, what, is, what are the mechanisms that are leading to that? So we took these profiles and uh, we do all of our degradations in just in steady state, so that's the untreated. But then we started treating each one of the cells to arrest in the different cell cycles. So G1 arrest, S arrest, or G2M. And what we saw immediately was that uh, the degradation profiles in these arrest conditions were very different uh, amongst each other. And only the G1 phase recapitulated what we saw for the overall degradation in the steady state. And actually the G2M phase it looked very much like when we just treated the cells with the parental inhibitor alone, um, showing very slow loss. So what is happening in these different phases? Well, first we asked, because CDK2 is, is changing structurally and changing its binding partners throughout these states, is the CDK2 even able to bind to the PROTAC in these various phases? And so we used the target engagement this time on the CDK2 to study that small molecule interaction. And we found actually CDK2 is able to bind uh, this compound in all of those phases. So it's not that CDK2 cannot bind the PROTAC in the various phases. What it did turn out is that CDK2 cannot form ternary complex in all phases, only in the phase G1, where we see this robust, uh, or where we see similar degradation to the, the steady state phase, do we see formation of the ternary complex with Cerebon. And actually in the other phases, uh, we do not see this, and um, it's likely in that G2M phase where we see slow loss that this loss is not due to protact mediated mechanism. So uh, we were very excited to see this and it brought about also another bigger question uh, that I alluded to earlier. We're seeing specific subpopulation target degradation of a, a protein. And while this was not engineered with this pan kinase protac, we began to wonder, could we potentially engineer uh, proteins either in certain complexes or at certain phases or stages in the developmental pathway to target them specifically for degradation rather than just getting rid of the entire population of a protein. And then the last story I really want uh, to highlight, I have just two slides here. Uh, it's been a great collaboration we've had with Nathaniel Gray's group. A paper is coming out, it's in press now. Um, but this was really looking at specificity and engineering of a CDK12 specific degrader. So they started with an inhibitor, made a, a, an initial protax, saw degradation of the CDK12. But the goal really was to get specific degradation of CD, CDK12 and not the related protein CDK13. And so what uh, the, the interesting approach taken by Nathaniel and his team was to model that complex 
between CDK12 and cerebellum and the compound or CDK13, cerebellum and the compound, and look to see which residues in that active kind of site and the predicted interface in that ternary complex could be uh, were important or could contribute to specificity, and also look at the mining pocket to see from a compound perspective, could they engineer a compound uh, that would give specificity only for CDK12 degradation and not CDK13. They were able to do that uh, based upon this modeling, this inner early modeling, and just shown here is that lead compound, uh, the BSJ4116. They also made a, a and basically the enantiomer control or, or the NC compound, the negative control, and the THC is a, the inhibitor compound. But what you can see with this is that it is specific for degradation of CDK12, and it does not change the levels of CDK13, and loss of CDK12 uh, does not change the levels of cycling K. So uh, they reached out to us to see if we could uh, look at the different ternary complexes uh, from their modeling predictions and also look at ternary complex formation to see that it supported the CDK12 specific degradation versus CDK13. And we found that it did. Uh, so we see the most robust uh, ternary complex formation with the wild type CDK12. We were actually made mutations um, in the full length CDK12 or 13 proteins that they predicted from that modeling. And we saw with CDK12, we could weaken the ability to form ternary complex with the mutations in that predicted interface. And uh, interestingly, with CDK13, we could make mutations that would enhance uh, potentially the formation of the ternary complex uh, with CDK13. Uh, therefore, using these to alter the specificity. But what I find really exciting about this paper is that they went further and developed resistance to the CDK12 specific uh, degrader. They did it in two cell lines, both the JERCAT and the MOLT4 line. And uh, when they went and did the sequencing of these uh, resistance lines, they found that there were mutations in the CDK12 protein. So normally we report mutations or resistance occurring to degraders in the cerebellum or the colon machinery or other E2, E3 ligase, but here they actually saw mutations develop in the target protein, CDK12. These were in the G loop in the kinase domain, and uh, two separate mutations were found in the MOL4 and the JERCAT line. They did show that these uh, bind the PROTAC itself uh, less efficiently, um, and then we did further experiments making these mutations in the CDK12, again, the full length protein, and showed that they did not, uh, these mutations did not show appreciable ternary complex formation with cerebellum. So look for that paper. And I'd like to thank them also for letting me present it here today uh, for the first time. And uh, it was just been a fantastic collaboration. So with that, I'd like to end. I really would like to thank um, my team, shown here is our recent picture. We're getting ready to move into our new space, um, uh, which is a beautiful space uh, for us. Uh, but uh, the joke was, this is our next album cover for uh, the degraders. Um, but really, we I work with a fantastic group of colleagues in R&D, as well as the marketing and business sides in at, at Promega. Uh, listed here. And I really like to thank my collaborator Alessio for uh, really all the brainstorming and the creativity and uh, both of us pushing each other uh, to figure out how we could we could add to these new modalities in targeted protein degradation. And uh, it's just been fantastic work, uh, both on the SIM one as well as work with the MZ one. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Nathaniel Gray and his team for uh, reaching out to us to work with them on the CDK12 specific degrader. It, it was uh, also, again, a fantastic collaboration with them.